And uh, well, you know, that's me, that's where I am, and that's who supports me. Um, so I'll, my top course outline is I'll introduce the subject, I'll tell you about orientable active fluids, that is PLOX, and I'll tell you about some more, re more uh, structured uh, active systems, and I'll summarize. Um, I'm acutely conscious that this is a dynamics meeting, and then I've long admired dynamics days from a distance, and this is my first dynamics days meeting. Uh, and I know that active matter is not a usual subject of this conference, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we mean by active systems. So, you know, the reason for defining a system, a collection of or a category of matter called active matter is simply to take living systems or some essential features of living systems and uh, define something that allows such systems to be included in the big family of condensed matter and statistical systems. So basically active matter is matter made of particles that are, that are alive, either really alive or at least powered. So imagine you've got a system made of little objects, they could be cells or they could be little artificial components and each component is powered. And when I say each component is powered, I don't mean, so what I mean is that not just the system is far from equilibrium in the sense that a wire carrying current is far from equilibrium. I mean, each individual unit is taking up and dissipating energy, converting free energy into movement in some way. So um, it's Leibniz, I think, said it's a machine whose each part is also a machine. And that's clearly uh, what living matter is like. It's made up of cells, and each cell has that kind of machinery. And collections of such cells or active particles uh, we call active matter. And uh, you know, again, one can take you know two, two approaches to this. One can go after specific problems in living systems and try to answer them with the framework, or one can just say that okay, we are condensed matter and statistical physicists, and we want to understand the way in which systems of this type differ from systems at thermal equilibrium, and what general laws, general outcomes can we draw from this, and uh, which of them are merely interesting, which of them uh, really give you a deep insight into these systems and which of them are possibly even useful, especially if you can build systems of artificial components that imitate some of the features of living matter, you know, what can you do with that? But um, as a condensed matter physicist, you can uh, take a symmetry based view, you can think of different kinds of active systems, you can think of little droplets that transiently propel themselves in some direction, but are basically characterized by a concentration field. You might call that scalar active matter. You can think of systems of this sort. This is a, a vibrated surface in which, on which you have a particle that is moving in a direction set by the way in which it points. This is a macroscopic, you know, few millimeter long rod uh, on a vibrated surface, and it's walking through this background of beads. You can imagine particles whose breaking of detail balance or time reversal invariance is much more subtle. You can imagine the particles themselves have no head or tail. They're mainly elongated, and they move more along their length than transverse to their length. So these would form ordered phases uh, that would have a uniaxial structure, but no difference between forward and back, and would be described by a traceless symmetric tensor order parameter. Uh, you can... Of course, you can take entire living systems, flocks of animals or chunks of tissue and call that active matter, or you can take extracts of such, uh, you can take extracts of some essential biological material from a cell and create these artificial uh, biology-based constructs of active systems made of biofilaments and motors and the chemical fuel, namely ATP, needed to make them active. Um, you can even create what one might call quantum active matter by taking, say, a 2D electron gas and <clears throat> energizing it, agitating it with microwaves. You can have mechanically actuated or magnetic field actuated active systems and so on. So you can have a rich variety of active systems. Uh, and of course, you can have uh, systems with a variety of symmetries. You can have broken orientational symmetries. Uh, 
you can have your systems which macroscopically have a vectorial direction of order. You can have ones which are uniaxial and don't break four aft symmetry, even if the individual particles break it. Or you can have systems where the particles themselves are merely uniaxial and so forth. And you can also have more complicated structured active systems breaking translational order in one, two, or uh, three directions. So um, basically, you can therefore think about uh, the condensed matter and statistical mechanics of broken symmetry active systems. And you can analyze this by extending the techniques that have been so successful in working on such systems at thermal equilibrium extending them away from equilibrium by building equations of motion on general grounds and seeing what those equations predict. Um, there are also different dynamical regimes in which you might wish to explore active systems. You can, we, the terminology has evolved in the field of wet active matter for systems that are in a bulk fluid and where the interactions between different bits of the system are communicated through the fluid systems in which the momentum conservation of the particles plus fluid plays an essential role. Or you can imagine systems uh, where the dynamics takes place on an inert substrate and the interactions between the particles of the system are primarily by short range, uh, you know, by external volume or something. And the fact that there's an, a medium on which the dynamics is taking place is of less importance. And you can have such systems in the real living world or in artificial clocks like this one. Uh, there's also technically an important subcategory. You can take a bulk wet active system and confine it between two walls, as has been done here in this cartoon of this uh, microorganism, where there is a bulk fluid, there are walls which screen the hydrodynamic interactions, but still the presence of an ambient fluid whose total quantity is conserved makes a critical difference. Uh, to the uh, dynamics. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll now directly go to a couple of examples of active systems uh, and analyze them using uh, hydrodynamic uh, methods for building their equations of motion. Um, the subject has a long history. Uh, people in ethology, uh, that is the biological study of uh, animal behavior, as well as people trying to make movies of stampedes for Hollywood, uh, wrote down models uh, in which you had objects, each of which tries to align uh, with its neighbors. So here's one, here's the focal object, and here are its neighbors, and this guy tries to align with its neighbors. Uh, and uh, it also tries not to bump into its neighbors, and it also tries not to go too far away from its neighbors. You can take these elementary rules and make a model in which if the alignment rule is of finite precision, that is, the you, you align as best you can with some error, then you get a kind of phase diagram in which, as a function of density and noise, uh, these guys can condense into an ordered phase, which you'll call a flock. These uh, simple models uh, can be viewed as dry flocks because they're just agent-based and the dynamics, the ambient medium doesn't enter into them. And within such models, there was a flocking phase transition as first shown numerically by uh, Vichek and others, uh, and then analyzed uh, uh, in later work by Toner and Two uh, in a field theory. That field theory looked like this. It used a concentration field and an orientational order parameter, which was also essentially the velocity field of these particles. So you had an equation of motion for the concentration where the current of the active particles was proportional to the concentration times the local vectorial orientation. And um, the dynamics of the orientation proceeded by a combination of trying to minimize a free energy-like object which favors the formation of a local moment and favors neighboring regions aligning with each other, possibly orienting uh, in response to gradients. But where this orientation was not only a vector pointing in space, it had the characteristics of a velocity, namely it would advect itself. This combination is sort of funny chimera of 
uh, Ginzburg-Landau model for a magnet and uh, a PDE for a fluid uh, led to many interesting predictions, including that when noise is added, you could actually get long range order in two dimensions, uh, anomalous density fluctuations, wave-like excitations, and so on. Although this approach is in the spirit of hydrodynamics, the dynamics itself uh, is played out within this simple description, whether it's this particle-based model or uh, the resulting PDE. In this simple description, uh, there isn't a momentum-conserving bulk medium in which the dynamics is taking place. Each object can change its orientation and therefore its velocity locally without necessarily transmitting any momentum to the surrounding medium. So the first question we asked a long time ago was, what, is, what happens if this type of dynamics plays out in a fluid medium? Okay, so what does a, a wet polar ordered active system look like? So to describe flux in fluid, you want to somehow bring in the physics uh, of uh, momentum conservation into this dynamics. So the idea basically is you've got objects which in combination with the ambient fluid are a momentum conserving system. So, you know, when you swim through a fluid, you and the fluid together have total momentum, uh, which is fixed. Um, therefore, the force density associated with your motion, if you're a bacterium or if you're an alga, uh, is a dipolar force density in which the total force is zero. At the simplest level, that dipolar force density can push outward along your long axis as here, or can pull inward along your long axis as here. So you want to build the collective hydrodynamics of orientable objects endowed with permanent force dipoles. And when you do that, you get a hydrodynamic equation in which uh, the dynamics of the orientation can go downhill in an energy function and can couple to the flow through this, either through advection and rotation as here, or by aligning with the symmetric part of the velocity gradient as here. The orientation field created by these active particles endows the system locally with a stress which is bilinear in this vectorial orientation. So you have a hydrodynamic equation, which here I've written without inertia, purely as force balance, saying that viscous stresses are balanced by the intrins intrinsic self-propelling stresses of the active medium. In my cartoon here, each particle had a force dipole. This gives rise in a coarse grain picture to a force density bilinear in the orientation. Okay, F is a free energy favoring alignment. U is the hydrodynamic velocity field of particles plus fluid together. P is the orientation. S is the symmetric part of the uh, velocity gradient. So this set of equations, uh, when analyzed for the case of a macroscopically aligned state, uh, led to rather surprising results. And I'm returning to these very old results because of new findings about uh, a more comprehensive understanding of the instabilities here. So take these equations, consider a mean aligned state with orientation in some direction, perturb at wave vector Q about that mean aligned state and solve for the dynamics. What you find, what we found a very long time ago at this point uh, is that the aligned state, even though elasticity tries to restore alignment, has an instability which within this Stokesian hydrodynamic approximation has a growth rate that depends on direction, the direction of the wave vector with respect to the aligning, uh, alignment direction, but not on its magnitude at small wave numbers. You have a growth rate characterized by a single inverse time scale, which is the scale of active stress divided by viscosity, and a direction dependence, which is such that depending on whether this active stress, depending on the sign of the active stress, depending on whether you have particles like this or like this, will grow either for wave vectors near, nearly, you know, in, within 45 degrees of the aligning direction or for wave vectors outside a cone of 45 degrees of the aligning direction. So these guys go unstable 
in one class of perturbations, these in an opposite class. Basically, what you'll get is these guys go unstable to bend and these to splay. The picture is basically that if you have a state that's macroscopically aligned like that, these guys go unstable to perturbations of this sort, and these guys, pushers, go unstable to perturbations of this sort. And you can kind of see why by in a cartoon by introducing a perturbation and seeing that the secondary flow induced by the stress, the perturbed stresses further tilt the orientation in the direction in which you're already tilted it. So this is an old story, 20 years old, actually. Uh, the important features of it are that there is a single time scale viscosity divided by active stress. The instability kicks in on length scales larger than a scale set by the competition between active stresses and the intrinsic orientational elasticity of the medium. On those long scales, in a bulk system, bulk but still without inertia, things simply go unstable. Um, in more detail, if you analyze the dynamics in terms of the elementary distortions of an, of an oriented state, namely splay, bend, and twist, what you find is there are two classes of instabilities, one where bend interpolates to splay, which I already showed you, and one where bend interpolates to twist. This one is unstable for all directions other than pure twist. In this one, you have an instability that interpolates between stable, either unstable in bend, stable in twist, or stable in bend, unstable in twist. Uh, this picture of the instability is well borne out by careful experiments, most recently by the uh, Barcelona group, uh, but also by a variety of other studies, including flows inside a cell. So this instability is borne out in, in great detail, including uh, the way the instability sets in through bend, the dependence of growth rate on wave vector, and so forth. Um, but um, one should pause at this point and ask, uh, isn't, aren't there other possibilities? You know, can you have stable flocks in bulk fluid? Let's make a comparison to two very different systems both of which may be familiar to this dynamic group. Uh, the Stokesian hydrodynamic interaction with its one over R uh, decay of velocities is, has a tempting similarity to gravity into electrostatics in both of which you have one over R field. And you know that a gravitational system <clears throat> has a famous instability, namely the genes instability, which is length scale independent if you don't have a pressure uh, and an electrostatic system is famously very rapidly relaxing at long length scales. Both of these have a single time scale set by the strength of the interaction. In the case of gravity, it's always destabilizing. In the case of an electrolyte, it's always stabilizing at small wave numbers. Is it possible to have stable flocks in bulk fluid if you engineer your system a little bit more cleverly? So I just wanted to briefly pause and draw your attention to recent work by Ananya Maitro who shows that you can, in fact, even in bulk fluid, have stable uniaxial order. If you consider a 2D fluid film at an interface in a bulk 3D fluid, if the bulk system is incompressible, but flow isn't confined to the 2D plane, but can move outwards into three dimensions, it turns out this long range character of the hydrodynamic interaction can lead to stable 2D flocks, in fact, anomalously stable 2D flocks in a 3D uh, film. What's crucial for getting this family of instabilities is not only the presence of active stresses with a single time scale, namely viscosity over active stress, but also that the dynamics should entirely take place in a medium in which the fluid is conserved. So if you have a bulk, if you have a fluid film in bulk 3D, if you have a fluid film in which the flow is not restricted to 2D, it turns out you can have long range and anomalously stiff uh, 2D order. However, the aim of my talk today is not to talk about that class of problems. It's to ask what happens when you take this basic instability picture 
and introduce inertia and the vectorial character of the order parameter. So if you introduce the vectorial character of the order parameter, then the equation of motion, which I wrote down a few slides ago, now acquires uh, a self-advection term, as in the Toner 2 model. The polar order parameter advects itself. Can this stabilize uh, aligned clocks in bulk fluid? The answer is no. It turns out you just get the same instability that we wrote down earlier, only it's carried by the mean aligned state at a speed given by the self-propulsion speed of the clock. Mere motility simply makes the instability travel. You can't outrun the instability because the Stokesian instability, given the peculiar character of the, the static Stokesian approximation, is instantaneous. It kicks in everywhere at the same time, like Newtonian gravity. Will inertia alone stabilize the active aligning and uh, orientational instability? So now let's take the equations of motion I wrote down earlier, not put in polarity, that is not put in self-advection, but include inertia in the form of at least unsteadiness and if necessary, uh, the advective nonlinearity as well. Well, then it turns out you get an instability which now is not instantaneous, it has an invasion speed because whereas earlier the instability, let me show you, the instability had this character that it grew at a rate sigma a over mu in at all at small wave numbers with a direction dependent character. Now, instead of being a first order dynamics, if you work in a description where inertia dominates, you get an instability with a growth with an invasion speed, a growth rate linear in wave number. This is frequency squared. This is wave number squared. So you have something with a speed, but it's not a wave speed, it's an invasion speed. Depending on the sign of this active stress in some set of directions, you'll get omega squared going as minus q squared. So you'll have an instability with the characteristic speed set by the square root of the active stress divided by the mass density of the system. So it's still unstable. So polarity makes the instability move, but the intrinsic character of the instability is still of instantaneous growth. Inertia gives the instability a speed. And so we ask, what happens when you have both inertia and the vector character of the order parameter taken into account in a single description? So the equations of motion for that problem are this dynamics for the orientation field, for the vector orientation field, including self-advection as well as advection by the fluid, and this dynamics for the momentum density or the velocity field of the system with, crucially, with active stresses here, bilinear in the vector order parameter. The fact that the system is active enters in two ways here, one through the active stresses buried in here with the scale sigma a, and one through the self-advection. The oriented state advects itself with a speed v0, and distortions in the orientation give rise to active flows through stresses of characteristic strength sigma a. So you have two, in, in principle, independent parameters governing the active stresses in this problem. Um, the reason these two parameters are independent is this stress comes from the strength of the force dipole that mobilizes the particle. And this guy comes from the characteristic speed at which the particles move. And the two don't have to really be related. You can imagine a swimmer which has a force dipole coming from this kind of dynamics like a bacterium and a speed dominantly coming from um, a purely quadrupolar force density like this swimming torus from Ed Purcell's uh, article. So if you put these two together, you get something with an independent scale of self-propulsion and active stress. Or you can think of it as an object which swims because of a slip velocity on its surface in which the, which you, if you expand that surface slip velocity in polar coordinates on the surface, the coefficient of P1 of cosine theta sets the scale of the speed. 
and the coefficient of P2 of cosine theta sets the scale of the active stress. So there's any number of ways of seeing why swimming, the swimming speed and the force dipole strength don't have to be directly connected to each other. So if you now go back to these equations of motion and now analyze their uh, dynamics and you see that there are some independent, uh, some crucial uh, dimensionless groups, the most important of which is the, a measure of the relative magnitudes of the self-propelling speed and the active stress. I've written it here as what looks like a ratio of stresses, but it's more usefully viewed as a ratio of two speeds or squared ratio of two speeds, self-propelling speed and the instability invasion speed. You recall I said that when you include inertia in the orientation of dynamics, the, align, the instability of the aligned state has a characteristic speed, which is given by the square root of active stress over density. That's one speed. Self-propulsion or self-advection is another speed. And this ratio turns out to be absolutely crucial. There's also another important dimensionless group, which is the, rate at, the ratio of the rates at which uh, orientation diffuses versus vorticity diffuses. That number in all systems, all liquid crystalline systems that we know of is minute and will always work in the regime where it's small. This parameter, which is really a kind of Reynolds number, and in fact will be a Reynolds number at the particle scale if the active stress is simply viscous at the scale of the particle. This guy, this quantity R, is really what we're most concerned with. And you recall that the instability in the strict Stokesian limit had this character of a single time scale. When you combine inertia and polarity and active stresses, what you get an instability is an instability whose growth rate at linear order in wave number is a competition between the active stress and the self-propelling speed. And if the self-propelling speed is large enough, you can overcome this instability. So the picture is the following. If you look at the growth rate as a function of wave number, then in the strict Stokesian limit, that is zero, uh, zero inertia, you get an instability which has a non-zero growth rate at small wave number, that's the green line. As you turn up self-propelling speed, keeping the density non-zero, this instability now acquires a linear growth rate at small wave number, that's the red line. And as you increase self-propelling speed, the instability weakens. It turns out to become an order wave number squared instability. And for large enough self-propelling speed, the instability goes away altogether. And you have a stable dynamics. So the admixture of a fairly small amount of inertia, kind of order one amount of inertia, it turns out, is enough to eliminate the intrinsic instability of the line state and give you stable flocks in bulk momentum conserving fluid. This, of course, is a linear stability analysis. We would have loved to make more definitive statements through an analytical theory, but uh, we're not clever enough to do so. And so we decided to exploit the cleverness of a direct numerical simulation. So we took these pair of partial differential equations and uh, solve them numerically. That was Ryan Chatterjee's PhD work. This is a paper that came out last year with Ryan, the late Aditi Simha, and Navdeep Rana, and Prasad Perlekar at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Hyderabad. So what we showed is that as a function of this Reynolds number-like parameter, and as a function of the ratio of orientational diffusivity to kinematic viscosity, you get a dynamical phase diagram, which if you look at it just over near this, this end, which is probably the physical regime, has a region in which the aligned state is unstable with growth rate linear in wave number. That region turns out to be numerically a state which is best described as defect chaos or defect turbulence. If you cross the threshold to the instability, where the instability changes character from linear to quadratic in wave number, even though linear stability analysis predicts 
that the aligned state is unstable with growth rate quadratic and wave number. In practice, numerically, we find that state, although it jitters around a bit and fluctuates a bit and is indeed chaotic, it doesn't lead to defect proliferation. And the aligned state, on average, retains orientational order. So you go from defect turbulence to an unstable, intrinsically noisy but ordered state, which one can call phase turbulence. If you go beyond the second instability, you go into a completely quiescent state in which all perturbations decay. Uh, so this is the picture, whether in 2D or in 3D, you go from a defect turbulent state to a somewhat disturbed but on average ordered state. If you look, if you watch the numerics, what you see is something that looks like this, in which defects start to proliferate and the system becomes completely filled with hedgehog defects, whether in two or in three dimensions. Whereas if you look at the regime in which the growth rate is quadratic in wave number, you see a noisy state, but one which finally manages to remain ordered on average. If you measure the orientational order parameter, If you take all the take this, look at this vector field P and look at its macroscopic average and then take the magnitude, you find that as a function of this Reynolds like parameter, it goes from a value consistent with zero to a well defined non zero value. If you look at orientational correlations as you approach this point, they become they're exponentially decaying with a correlation length that grows. There's a nice, reasonably nice collapse of the data with respect to a single length scale. And if you plot the inverse of that single length scale against the inverse of this Reynolds like parameter, you see that that length scale seems to be aspiring to diverge at a non zero value of one over R, that is to say, a finite value of R. This length scale is essentially the inter defect uh, scale, and it seems to grow reasonably clearly as you approach the phase transition. The defect turbulence state uh, seems to obey Perot's law, whether you look in two or three dimensions, consistent with the idea of point like topological defects. Uh, if you look in the steady state that you observe at moderately large values of the inner shear parameter, what you find is that fluctuations of the order parameter transverse to the mean ordering direction have a much larger magnitude than those along with fluctuations along the mean order in direction. This is a tentative signature that there is a number Goldstone mode or broken symmetry mode in the ordered state in this problem. These numerical measurements are not brilliant, but they're at least indicative that there's a well-defined ordered state. You see this in two and in three dimensions. So um, that's the end of my, the first part of my talk. In the rest, where I see I only have six minutes, I will tell you very briefly about a completely different system. I will now go to translationally ordered active systems and tell you a little bit about them. Our major interest is in the effects of chirality. Chiral systems are, chiral objects are objects that, as Kelvin told us, are not superposable on their mirror image by uh, rigid uh, motions. Uh, our typical notion of chirality in three dimensions is illustrated by these conch shells. In two dimensions, if you have an object that looks chiral, Clearly, if you go to the other side, you can change its chirality. So if you have a 3D chiral object and a vectorial direction defined, then you can talk about intrinsic 2D chirality for that object as well. Um, one of the studies that motivated us is the idea that two rather different one-dimensionally ordered systems, namely smectic liquid crystals in which there's a density wave and well-defined layers, and cholesteric liquid crystals which are an orientation wave with no true layers, but is chiral. These two systems were shown by Lubensky and more recently later by Rajihovsky and Lubensky to have exactly the same long wavelength elasticity and hydrodynamics at thermal equilibrium. So it's curious because that means the long wavelength mechanics doesn't have any signature of chirality. Of course, the long wavelength optics does have a signature. So we were curious whether this cloaking of chirality survives even in um, active systems. So we built the hydrodynamics of active systems. 
by saying that imagine you had a general pseudoscalar order parameter psi obeying a conservation law of this sort and general stresses that you can build from such a pseudoscalar order parameter which for a chiral systems would simply be bilinear ingredients of it uh, and for chiral systems would be the simplest object you can write down which is rank two and chiral which it turns out is this rather complicated looking object we showed that you can build the hydrodynamics of translationally ordered active systems simply by governing this order parameter with a free energy functional that favors a density wave and analyzing the properties of perturbations about a density wave state in which those perturbations have an amplitude and a phase that phase is the broken symmetry variable of this ordered state this chiral active stress gives rise to an interesting class of force densities which are tangent to contours of the mean curvature i'm being a little too quick here the idea is the following that you have a if you had a layered state then the displacements about that layered state are described by this displacement field there are interesting new force densities associated to chirality which it turns out have this form which means they act along tangents to the contours of constant mean curvature uh, it's an interesting kind of breaking of what is called maxwell betty reciprocity which i don't have time to get into but the result is that if you take the system and provoke an undulational instability either because of built-in active stresses normal to the layers or by deliberately pulling on the system that undulated state because of this weird new active force density will acquire a vortex lattice of this character so um, you can therefore take an active chiral layered system induce an undulation instability and that undulation instability will stir itself in this nicely organized way with an alternating array of vortices clockwise anti-clockwise clockwise anti-clockwise anti in a square lattice so you can have a system which can build a flow vortex lattice all on its own and you can turn on or switch off that flow lattice just by pulling on or pushing on the active systems there are interesting stories in two dimensions also you can get uh, spontaneous uh, kind of tilted value cross instabilities and there are even more interesting stories which i guess i really do not have the time to talk about if you consider two dimensional active systems imagine you have a system of columns uh, you can imagine an active version of such a system uh, in the bundle of microtubules um, in the axon of nerve cells. Uh, you can do the same trick. You can write down the hydrodynamics of the system starting from general considerations. Uh, Two-dimensional systems are interesting because you now have um, slightly more scope for uh, uh, interesting physics because you've got a direction defined by the uh, preferred axis and you have a whole plane of directions defined by the uh, density wave and uh, you can get a very interesting class uh, of dynamical behaviors in which the longitudinal and the transverse displacement field modes mix if the system is not only uniaxial and translationally ordered and chiral but also is polar along that unit axis uh, preferred axis you can get an interplay between longitudinal and transverse displacements, which has the character of, uh, it's like a position and a momentum beating against each other, but these are both displacement-like variables. So you can get elastic waves in the completely viscosity-dominated limit due to polar chiral um, active stresses. Um, that's all I have time for. I've introduced a general framework for intrinsically, intrinsically non-equilibrium or powered matter, applied it to broken symmetry hydrodynamics in a variety of systems. I've told you how uh, inertia allows one to create stable aligned flux in active systems. I guess that's my alarm telling me that 40 minutes is up. I've shown you the effects of inertia on flux and showed that active flux with inertia can outrun their own instability. And I've told you a little bit about translationally ordered active systems including some rather intriguing states like spontaneous flow, vortex lattices and layered systems, and an emergent or elasticity in columnar phases. I'll stop there and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Sriram, for a very interesting talk.
So time for questions, please. Maybe I will uh, kick off. Uh, so, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was a bit confused when you said that, you know, uh, there was a case where the linear stability analysis uh, did not yield results, if I understand correctly, or you could not conclude something from that, but it still was stable. Is that? Uh... Right. So I, uh, the correct statement is not that it was stable. Let me go back to that slide. So, if you take these equations and perturb about an aligned state, so if you have an aligned quiescent state, zero hydrodynamic velocity field and macroscopically aligned polar order parameter. You perturb and look at the resulting dynamics. What you find in a linear stability analysis is that for small values of inertia, you are unstable with growth rate linear in wave number. For larger values, the order Q instability goes away and you still have a growth rate that's quadratic in wave number, but still this state where the growth rate is quadratic in wave number, if you study yeah. the system numerically, we study the full nonlinear PDEs numerically, what you find mm. is indeed that the aligned state, if you start from a perfectly aligned state and perturb it slightly, instability start to grow, but the interplay of instability at small wave number non-linearities that couple the small wave number mode to larger wave number modes mm -hmm. and stable behavior at large wave number end up giving you a state in which non-linearities effectively stabilize the system leading to a noisy that is if you you know if you look at this look at this dispersion relation and imagine numerically saying i want the theory for if you can see my cursor i want the theory for this regime of wave number imagine i introduce some artificial line here. So I'm going to look at the effective theory for wave numbers smaller than the peak growth wave number. And, you know, build an effective theory for that by numerical coarse graining. The claim is that our numerical results suggest that the effective dynamics at small wave numbers is stochastic because of the interplay of instability, nonlinearity, and stability at large wave number. The system is spatial temporally chaotic but not so chaotic as to destroy the system. Instead, it gives you noisy phase fluctuations of the orientation, but the system on average remains ordered. It's a little bit like if you took the kuramoto sevashinsky equation, you recall mm -hmm. kuramoto sevashinsky has a diffusivity with the wrong sign. Therefore, if you have a displacement, the height field in the kuramoto sevashinsky equation, if you perturb it, is supposed to grow with the dispersion relation that's quadratic in wave number here. But the effective long wavelength theory of Karamat Sushinsky, as shown by uh, uh, Jayat Prakash, Hayo, and Pandit, is a stochastic PDE with a positive diffusivity. So, a, a deterministic PDE with a negative diffusivity and nonlinearities effectively behaves at small wave numbers like a stochastic PDE with a positive diffusivity. Something okay. similar appears to be happening here. We have not done an analysis at the level of Hayo, Jayat Prakash, and Pandit to show that that's really what's happening. But numerically, the system retains on average an order while fluctuating about it. So it's as I though you, you align, you have instability that start to grow, non-linearities kick in, they suppress the instability. And this keeps happening, but not to such an extent as to kill the order, just to give you an effective emergent noise from the spatial temporal chaos. This state is defect turbulent. This state is only phase turbulent. That's okay. only a numerical conclusion. We don't have a kind of, you know, pakka demonstration that you can, hmm. that you can really yeah. find the effective theory, effective stochastic theory that is worth for the future. And it's substantially harder in this set of PDEs than it was for uh, going from Kuramath Sersinski to KPZ. Thank you. Uh, Sinam, there's actually a question on this uh, Zoom. Can you please read it? Sure. Uh, hang on. Let me, why don't I stop sharing and look at the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, could I ask a yeah. Rui Zhang yeah, asks, could I ask a right. clarification question for 3D chiral system? Is biaxiality required to write down the chiral stress term? So our trick for two or 3D chiral systems is that 
we write down the coupled equations for a zero scalar order parameter and a momentum conserving uh, and a hydrodynamic velocity field. The physics of the ordered state is emerges by writing down a free energy functional governing the pseudo scalar order parameter that favors various kinds of translationally ordered systems. Let us say uh, a lamellar or a columnar ordered state. So you don't have to introduce any preferred directions by hand. You can write down a free energy functional, look at what kinds of steady states or what kinds of mean ordered states it permits and then perturbing about that state. Just as you, you know, if you want to introduce special directions in a 3D, to, if you want to get the elasticity of a 3D solid, you can write down a free energy functional with just a scalar order parameter, namely a density. And if that free energy functional favors ordering at a non-zero wave number, you condense into that state and then you perturb about that state and uh, you look at the perturbations and those will reflect the reduced symmetries of the ordered state. So that's what you do. That's how you do it. So you don't really need to write down the twisting director of a cholesterol or anything like that. You have an order parameter. You don't even ask what that order parameter is. It could be a composition variable. It could be the angle about some direction, or it could be a concentration of uh, chiral particles. So that's how you do it. Thank you, Sridhar. Is there any further urgent questions? If not, let's thank Sridhar for a very interesting talk. Thanks very much. Sorry, I'm not there. <laughs>